Are you feeling the sorrow of God? Did you ever have one of those days where you just wake up and everything's going good and all of a sudden you just feel sorry and you start to get just feeling down and just kind of anxious feeling and you think, what's wrong with me? Everything's going fine in my life right now. I have no reason for depression. I'd, I just don't feel good. And, you know, if, if you're an artist, you, you say, I, I just can't get inspired to do things. And, and, and I don't know what's wrong. I, everything's okay in my life right now, but I just, I feel just ugh, bad. Um, I can tell you a lot of people are going through that right now. And a lot of people don't understand it. Um, depression, they're going to the doctors and the doctors are diagnosing them with having all kinds of depression and anxiety disorders and whatever else. And they take the medication, it doesn't help. Um, what's going on? Well, I'm going to tell you, uh, there's some things that are very, very wrong right now in this day and age. Um, some things that are very wrong with the earth, some things that are wrong with people, and you can feel it. Um, everybody feels it, but most people choose to cover it up with uh, whatever they choose, be it entertainment, drugs, alcohol, uh, just whatever. Um, very few people want to actually get in touch with this feeling of sorrow. But I'm going to show you today from the Bible what the Bible has to say about this issue of the sorrow of God. Um, what's going on? Um, and again, just understanding some things that are happening right now in our world, uh, there's a lot of bad things going on with the environment. Um, just to list a couple things, I mean, you have uh, mechanized logging now has taken over the old way of logging, and and uh, mechanized logging can, can just decimate a forest within days, where it would have taken loggers, you know, months and whatever else to do the job, they can just destroy it in, in, in days. And uh, I'm a former logger, so don't, don't say I'm a, some kind of tree-hugging environmentalist. I'm not. Um, but I've seen the, the destruction. A beautiful forest just turned into a wasteland in no time at all with these big machines. And they're just going through and just making a wreck of things. Um, you have genetically modified crops are destroying bee, whole bee, bee populations. And, and they're saying this is not good. The, the bees are dying off. And birds are dying and, and fish, massive fish die-offs and, and uh, war. There's all kinds of different rumors of war out there and nuclear weapons and, and things. And, and uh, you can just feel the hatred among people. And you can see people, they're just, their souls are just, are just so darkened. I mean, you just go out, the, the, the joy, the happiness that people once manifested is just not there. You can just see it. You, you try to talk to people and and it just, everybody's feeling this sorrow. There's, there's a feeling, just a, you know what I mean. Most of you know what I mean, if you're awake to what's going on. And I mean, you can get down through the list. There's so many things. The economy. What about the economy? Uh, every nation is, in, is horribly in debt, in, into the trillions, tens of trillions of dollars. How are we going to pull out of that thing? People are in debt. They, they don't even own anything. Their car is owned by the bank. Their house is owned by the bank. They're going and they're paying their utility bills with credit cards, not with the money that they have. Uh, buying groceries, buying a stick of gum with a credit card. It's not good. People can, if you're awake, if you have any kind of an intelligence at all, you can see, hey, things are not going good. And you can feel that. There's something very seriously wrong. Let me show you what the Bible has to say about that. I'm going to show you first here in Matthew chapter 24. Jesus is speaking to his disciples at this point in time in the Bible. And, um, and they ask him, basically, what are, what are the signs of the end of the world? Okay. And verse 4, he says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. There's a lot of people who call themselves Christian, and they're not Christian. Every Catholic priest out there is actually, according to Catholic doctrine, they are called another Christ. Um, the, the priest takes the place of Christ, according to the Catechism. And yet they're molesting children all the time. It's just coming out all the time. 
Uh, the Catholic Church is not the church that Jesus Christ founded. I can assure you of that. Plenty of other studies to prove that. But um, verse 6, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Hmm. Wars and rumors of wars. Do we see that? Iran, China, America, Venezuela, Russia, building up their military while America is tearing down its military, dismantling its military bases. Hmm. Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, all these different things in Libya and Syria. and There's plenty of big wars out there and, and some more coming. Verse 7, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. Now look at this. All these are the beginning of sorrows. There you see it. Sorrows. Well, who's the sorrow associated with? You see? The title of this sermon is, Are You Feeling the Sorrow of God? You say, well, then that's the sorrow there? Yes. And I'm going to show it how, how it connects to you. Saved or lost, by the way. And by the way, you can be the most hardcore atheist, say, I don't believe the Bible, whatever else. You still have to accept the fact that there are some major world-changing, life-changing events that are coming. I'll give you another one I didn't mention earlier. Uh, the whole GMO crop thing. Uh, what about the, the issue of crop irrigation in the Midwest here in America? See, they had the Dust Bowl back there in the 1920s where they had no rain for a long time, a lot of drought, and it was just blowing all these dust storms came through and, and drove a lot of the farmers off the land. And then they fixed it by tapping into the aquifer. And now the biggest aquifer out there is going dry. Within a couple of years, they're saying it's going to be completely dry. And it's not just in the Midwest, okay? It's out in California too with the vineyards. All of a sudden, these people are tapping into these vineyards and or excuse me, tapping into the, the aquifers out there, and other farms are losing their water. Their wells are going dry. And in India, and other countries as well, Central America, South America, the aquifers are drying up. Hmm. Not very good times coming. Okay, but let's look about this thing of the beginning of sorrows here, and uh, something else I want to show you. Interesting here in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. I'll read that. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noe were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Noe is the Greek word for Noah. Noah is the Hebrew word there, the Hebrew name Noah. Verse 38, For as in the days that were before the flood... Uh, they were they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noe entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So it's talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. But Jesus says, before I come back to this earth, which we'll see why here in a little bit, before I come back, it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah, back before the flood you say, well, I'm an atheist. I don't believe these fairy tales from this book here, this old Bible. Okay, fine. You don't have to believe in those things. Um, just keep living in your little opium pipe dream there that uh, everything's going to work out fine. And uh, there's always been war and there's always been, it's been violent before and whatever else. Keep thinking that. I would recommend you probably get into hard drugs or alcohol or something like that just to keep your mind dulled. All right. Just forget the sorrow that you're feeling. Or if you're actually waking up and saying, you know what, yeah, there are a bunch of things that are coming here. There's a bunch of things that are happening that uh, hasn't happened before. When in the past were the aquifers drying up? When in the past were there GMO crops that were destroying the bees? When in the past did militaries have nuclear weapons that could destroy millions of people like that? Oh, it's always been like this. No, it hasn't. No, it hasn't. And you know it. You know it and you feel it. But what's, what about this thing of the days of Noah? Go back to Genesis chapter 6.
Genesis chapter 6 in your King James Bible. Make sure you don't use the other ones. They come from the Vatican if you speak English. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 6. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And look at this. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. Uh, that sounds like sorrow to me. When you are grieved in your heart, there's sorrow. And when it says there that he was repented there, that he repented that he made man, he was sorry that he made man. You see, when you study the Bible, you'll see this thing where God, when he created the heaven and the earth, he gave man something. He had a choice. God had two options. One was to force his creation to worship him without any kind of a mind of their own, just make a bunch of robots. And he just creates them and they have no say, no will of their own, whatever. That's not what God did. God chose the second option there. I know it doesn't say God had two options, but just purely logical here. God could have made us robots or God could have done what he did. And that is he gave us free will. So God says, I'm going to make man and woman Adam and Eve, according to the Bible, put them in the Garden of Eden and then say, okay, you can do whatever you want. Just don't touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just don't go over there and eat of the tree. Excuse me. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? That's the only thing I'm saying. Everything else you can do. And what did Eve do? She went over and she ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And she caused Adam, her husband, to do the same thing. Hmm. Kind of interesting because the devil still uses the same tactic with a lot of people. You want to be wise? You want to be a god? You want to be a good atheist? Here, take of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then you'll be have your eyes opened. You'll be illuminated, enlightened. You'll be educated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you see there that God was grieved in his heart. Why? Well, probably because of the same thing that goes on today. People look at this out here, this beauty out here of nature, and they say, how can I exploit that? They don't come out and say, wow, how great is the God that created all of this and the intricacies of nature and, and, and just like walking around inside of an, an, a, a beautiful painting a beautiful piece of art. Wow, and you look and you hear the birds singing and you can feel the breeze and you can smell the smell of the trees and you can look at the flowers in the spring, not right now, and give God glory. No, no. Man comes down and they say, let's see how we can make money off of this. Uh, well, we have to destroy this to make money. Eh, whatever. We don't care. And, uh, oh, by the way, you over there, I hate you. Another one of the creation of God. I hate your guts. I'm going to kill you and take what you have. Oh, you have oil in the ground? As a result of the flood, people being buried in organic matter decaying and under pressure and creates oil. You have oil over there? Hmm. I want your oil. They say, oh, well, we'll sell it to you. No, that's not cheap enough. We want to take it from you. We're going to uh, liberate your country and take your oil from you. Uh, it's called the last however many wars that America's fought and a lot of the other countries have fought too. A war for resources. Killing one another. And uh, how about that 21st century killing? Biochemical weapons. Starving a country. Messing with their economy. So people lose everything. It's not just bullets and guns and swords and bayonets and spears and arrows. Oh, no. There's all kinds of new ways of war today. Economic warfare. Chemical warfare. I uh, find it ironic that almost all pharmaceutical drugs are made in communist China. The enemy of the West. But they make the uh, medicine of people in America. Hmm. How about that? Uh, do you think that they might be able to use that as a weapon in the future? Uh, I hate to tell you, friend, they already have. 
they've already got people so poisoned and so crippled. I mean, we're, we, you know, I'm sure you're seeing it. We, we live up in the middle of nowhere, up in northern Maine, but I'm sure you're seeing it. People just doing things that just have no rational explanation at all. They're on opioids, these people. You know, years ago, oh, somebody's a junkie, they're on heroin. Now, you can get heroin, you know, in the form of an opioid pill, you know, you can get that from your doctor, properly prescribed. Police pull you over, you say, hey, I just got my prescription. I'm higher than a kite, you know, and, and if you did a blood analysis or whatever else on me, you'd see I'm, I'm on drugs here and, and I shouldn't be driving, but I'm, I'm on my pharmaceutical pills. My doctor gave them to me. Um, we're already under attack by China here in America. And China is already under attack by America. World War III, I hate to tell you, World War III's already started. And it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. But if you're an atheist, you reject the Bible, you say this is all doom and gloom and all that other stuff, just keep telling yourself that. Tell yourself that it's all going to be okay. Everything's going to work out good in the end. After all, evolution says it gets better with time. See? And you can get all mad about the, the cruel God of the Bible and whatever else, even though you believe in a system that death basically is the means of getting ahead, survival of the fittest. So talk about cruel, but we won't go there, you know. Um, but you, everything's getting better. Man is getting better. Health is getting better. Science is getting better. Economies are getting better, you know. Hundreds of trillions of dollars of debt internationally and whatever else. But that's better for the economy. Keep telling yourself that. But if you're feeling the sorrow, the anxiety, understand you're feeling something that God feels. Your creator feels. You say, why is that? I'm, I'm not a Christian. I don't, I don't know God personally. I'm going to show you as we continue in the study here. Here's a good one. Job chapter 21. Job chapter 21. Job chapter 21 and verse 7, 17 it is. How oft is the candle of the wicked put out? You know, God, you know, you say, I, I knocked his lights out, you know. He's dead, in other words. How often is the candle of the wicked put out? How often do wicked people die? Every minute, probably every couple of seconds, some wicked person dies. And, and how oft cometh their destruction upon them? You know, the, the Bible talks about thine own wickedness shall correct thee. Uh, these people that come out and, and rape and, and destroy and, and pillage a forest, a beautiful forest, for money and for the profit, um, they're actually destroying themselves. It's kind of interesting because you get into the cycle of, I got to get this quarter million, half a million dollar machine and try to pay it off and work hard and you get all the stress of that and everything else because you need to make the big money to pay off the big money so that you can get in more big money so that you can, you know, <laughs> and, and you get into the cycle of things and you stress yourself out and you destroy yourself instead of just being content, you see. People kill themselves. Their own wickedness destruct, destroys them. Their destruction comes upon them. You see? But look at this. God distributeth sorrows in his anger. You know when God gets angry? When God starts to look down and he says, you know what, it repents me that I've made man. You know what he does? He starts to distribute sorrow. You know why? As a warning. Does it sicken you? If you're a lost person out there, does it sicken you to see a beautiful forest decimated? All for the sake of, of money? Does it sicken you to see, uh, name it, the, the nature being exploited, children being uh, horribly molested by Catholic priests, and, and yet the Catholic priests just get shifted to some other place? Do you have a cry for justice within you that's strong? Or do you just, are you just indifferent? As long as it doesn't affect me, I don't care. I only care about myself, only about my life. I hope not. I hope that you're not that kind of a, a wicked monster. I hope that you're actually concerned for your fellow man, for nature, for things like that. 
but it's going to lead to sorrow. Why? Because God is angry. God is looking down on His creation. And he's saying, I gave you free will and this is how you use it. And God's going to do something about that. You're feeling sorrow, that depression that you feel, that, that feeling of just, I don't even know what to do today. Somebody says, hey, would you like a piece of your favorite food? No, I, I just don't, I'm not in the mood for that. Would you like to go hiking? Would you like to go fishing? Would you like to go to the store? Would you like to go on vacation? Would you like to, I don't feel like doing any of that. I just feel, ugh, sorrow. Why? You're feeling what God feels. God is trying to get in contact with you. The God of the universe, he, he loved you enough to die on the cross in your place. We're going to get to that. He's trying to contact you. You say, well, I can feel the, the presence of Mother Nature when I'm out in nature. It's not Mother Nature. This is God's creation. He's the one that made it, and He's trying to contact you. That's why you feel sorrow. Don't cover it up with alcohol, with drugs. Go to the doctor and they say, oh, you, you have some chemicals that aren't there in your brain, so we're going to give you petrochemicals, oil, essentially, to correct this. That's insanity. So, in other words, the people who are mentally well have petrochemicals in their brain? How does that even work? <laughs> okay, here's, an, here's, a, here's a depression pill that's made out of toxic chemicals. And you need it. Other people don't because they have it automatically in their head. It's insanity. But that is modern man. <laughs> but let me show you. Isaiah 53. I'll show you what your God did for you. Or God did for you. He's probably not your God yet. But hopefully he will be soon. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 1 through 5. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Not many people believe this report right here. God writes His Word down, gives you a copy of it. It's available to you. Eh, I don't know about that Bible. There's contradictions. There's this. There's that. I, science is disproved. Yeah. Verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus was not the attractive guy in the Catholic paintings. Sorry. Uh, there are no paintings today of Jesus Christ. Show me anywhere in Scripture where Jesus sat down and allowed somebody to paint his picture. I don't think so. Verse 3. He is despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. How often do you think about your Creator? If we're honest, all of us will say, not very much. We've done a lot of things in our life that we just kind of go about our life and we forget about our Creator. We forget about our God. Why we're here. What is the purpose of life? And how does that make Him feel? How would you feel if you created all this out here? You created it for somebody and you were so excited to have them come over. And you wanted to show them and they just took a walk through it and just didn't even care. Would that lead to sorrow? Yeah, it would. Yeah, it would. But I'm going to show you why you feel that sorrow of God here in just a little bit. But here's what God did for you. Verse 4. Surely He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. You've been wronged. People have done bad things to you. You've, you've seen bad things and whatever else. The Lord knows. He knows what you're going through. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But look at verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. You study the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It was violent. It was brutal. Religious people killed him. The religious Jews of his day and the pagan Romans, still working together to this day. You know, nearly 2,000 years or whatever later, here we are, still working together, Jews and Catholics. What the Antichrist is going to come and confirm his covenant between Jews and Catholics. Again, I've done other studies on that. Not going to get into a big thing here. But uh, Jesus died a horrible death. He was put to death by organized religion. 
The people that worship in churches, you know, uh, think about that one. The people that go out and, and steal things from other people and exploit God's creation, they were the ones that killed Jesus. And the system that he set up bears no resemblance to what is modern Christianity. You start to study this Bible, this King James Bible here, and you start to look at modern churches with the Sunday best and the altar calls and the, all this other stuff, and you realize, you know what, that's not in here. What is that stuff? It's the creation of man. You can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and come out and worship Him in a place like this. And you meet other Christians that are of the same mindset and there's instant fellowship. No matter what race or nationality or ethnicity you are or whatever else, there's a bond there, a spiritual fellowship. It's amazing. The world can't fake that. They try with their organized religion, but uh, they can't do it. They can't pull it off. Jesus died for your sins. Okay? Let me show you another verse of Scripture here. I'm going to show you something in the New Testament here. Colossians chapter 1. You say, I don't understand though. Okay, I get the fact that you're saying this thing about feeling this sorrow, and I do feel that sorrow, but if I'm not a Christian, why would I feel that sorrow? I don't understand. You're saying I have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but uh, I don't but yet I can feel the sorrow of God? How does that work? How is it that sometimes you'll see, as a Christian, you'll actually see a born-again Christian, not church-going, I'm saying, you'll actually see lost people that have a great deal of discernment. And you'll see them, and, you, and, and my heart goes out to people like that, and they're, and they're saying, things aren't getting better, okay? I'm not buying this whole facade of this fake world anymore. I feel something really serious is going on, and I don't know if there's a God or the universe or I don't know, but I just, I, I, I feel things that God's trying to get in contact with you. But how can they feel that if they're not saved? Let me show you. Colossians chapter 1 verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Okay, this is talking to saved people here. And I'm going to show you where it ties into lost people here in just a minute. But when you get saved, God pulls you out of that darkness and brings you into the light of His Word. All of a sudden, you start to understand this book. You know why lost people find so many contradictions in this Bible here? Because they don't have the light to understand it. The Holy Spirit's not there to guide them in this. Oh, that's not a contradiction. Okay, I can see this and I can... Oh, wow. The Holy Spirit will show you what this book means if you're saved. If you're lost, well, you're dead in trespasses and sins. You aren't going to get it. There's a lot of things that God has to give you understanding. But let's continue. Verse 14, In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Jesus shed His blood on the cross. And He will purchase you. If you come to Him in the right state. I'll show you that here in a minute. Most people don't. That's why I had to say that. Verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. Okay, you say, what are you talking about? The Father is invisible. He is a soul. The Holy Ghost is a spirit. All right, Jesus Christ is the body. So when you get to heaven, you're going to see Jesus Christ. He is God, holy, completely God. And it's talking in context about Jesus. Here's where it gets important. Verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Who created you? Jesus. According to that passage right there. Jesus created you. Hmm. You say, well, I, I, no, I think the universe created me. No, Jesus. Jesus created you. Who created uh, this tree right here? Jesus. Who created that snow? Jesus. Who created the blue jay that's in the background acting up? Jesus. Who created the air that you breathe? Who created the mountains, the seas, the rivers, the plains? Jesus. He created everything and everybody. 
Verse 17. Here we go. And he is before all things. Jesus is the creator, so he's before all things. And by him all things consist. Jesus is the source of your life. He's the electric power plant, so to speak, that gives you, as the appliance, energy to keep going. It's kind of funny, really, when you think about these people that say, I don't believe in Jesus. Uh, they're actually saying, I don't believe in the thing that gives me life. I don't believe in the being that gives me my next breath. Or are they in for a shock when they die? Um, but here's the point, friend. If you're lost, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, understand you can still feel sorrow because by Him, your life consists. You keep breathing because you are connected to the source of all life in the universe. It isn't Mother Earth. It's Father God. You see? Jesus Christ is the source of your life. Verse 18 And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. He wants to reconcile you to himself. That's why you feel sorrow. That's why you feel something is there. You don't even have to understand all that's going on. Uh, the Bible says that the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. God knows everything. He knows of, of the, the thoughts of people and, and whatever else. He understands all of it. We don't have to understand all of it. I'm glad we don't. I'm glad we don't see everything like the Lord sees it. I think it would be quite vexing <laughs> if we saw everything that was going on. But the Lord knows. And in spite of that, he still wants to reconcile all things to himself. Why would you reject him? Verse 21, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Speaking to saved people. You know, you, you, people forget that. They look at a Christian and they say, Oh, you're little goody two-shoes, you're this and that. I wasn't in the past. A lot of wicked works, a lot of wicked thoughts, a lot of evil things. I deserve to die for some of the stuff I did in my past. But God wanted to reconcile me to himself. And I came to him broken as a sinner. And he saved me. He'll save you. Verse 22, In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. That's the beautiful thing about it. You can have the most messed up life, the most horrible, terrible past, and the Lord will say, you come to him for salvation and he saves you, and he says, clean slate, brand new start. I'll forget everything. You don't want his salvation? Then you'll have to pay for all the sins of your past, all the bad things that you've done to his creation. Very foolish if you decide to pay for your own sins. I'll show you one more place to turn to here on this issue of sorrow. So I don't know what to say about all this stuff. It's just a lot for me to think about. And, and yeah, I do see that there's some bad stuff coming, but I don't know if there is a God or, or whatever else. And I, I do feel the sorrow, though. Okay? Let me show you the verse to tie this whole thing together. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. For... Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Do you know how many brilliant people have blown their brains out? Very, very, and, and you know, what was it? Hem Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway, 12 gauge shotgun, <clears throat> blew his brains out. One of the greatest writers, novelist, or whatever the guy was. Great mind, till it was plastered all over the ceiling of the room he kill killed himself in. Terrible. Why would he do a thing like that? Because you see, he had worldly sorrow. A lot of celebrities killed themselves. Why? 
Happiness is when you get success. When you have enough women that you fornicated with, if you're a man or whatever, uh, when you have enough money, when you have enough power, when you have enough drugs and parties and wild this and that, and they get up there to that point in time in their life and they realize this isn't it. I thought this was going to be it. Recently saw a thing with uh, Anthony Hopkins, I think it was, he was interviewed and they said, what do you know? And he said, I know nothing. After all my success and everything else, I've gotten to the place where I just realized I don't know anything. It was, it was, I thought success might be here and it's not, you know, basically. At least he's honest, you know, a lot of them aren't honest. They just keep pretending, you know, and whatever else. Um, you would do well to get to a place where you say, you know what, the sorrow that I'm feeling, I believe it's coming from God and I'd really like to know God personally. Um, and without going into a huge big study, uh, God's judgment, God's wrath is coming to this world. God allowed man to have free will for a time, but it's coming to an end. And God is going to say, okay, you've messed up my earth long enough. You've lived in your sin long enough. Enough innocent people have been hurt. Now it's time for me to come back and judge the world. And he's going to judge it in righteousness. There's not going to be any buying the judge off or why have my, my Masonic connections and so I can kind of skirt my way out of the court system. Uh-oh, no, no, no. There's enough money that I can buy off local politicians and rezone a mountain in the area so I can mine it and put poison into the ground and whatever else actually true of this area. Um, I, can, I can pay off the right people. No, 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 no. That's coming to an end. God's judgment is coming. And the sorrow that you feel, those days when you just feel so depressed and so down and just there just doesn't seem to be any way out of it, the only way out is Jesus Christ. And you need to wake up to this. You, you need to understand God is going to judge and he's saying, okay, you want to feel some godly sorrow? Are you feeling the godly sorrow there? Are you feeling that vexation of seeing what's going on in the world? Come to me. You're not a good person. Okay, you're not some kind of a holy, well, I'm not like Hitler or whatever. Well, I certainly hope not, but God still views you as you, the, you've made mistakes. You've done wicked things in your past. You're probably doing wicked things right now in the present. Come to him as a sinner, broken, and say, okay, God, I'm not a good person. I can't make it up there and be on your level. I'm not like you. I need your help. Please save me. There's not much time left. God's not going to keep putting up with this world and the way it is. Um, the horror that's going to come to this world is just going to be mind-blowing. Uh, the Bible actually talks about it that he's going to have to, God's actually going to have to shorten the days so that there would be some flesh saved. So some people will survive what's coming in the future. So the sorrow that you feel, those days where you just can't get inspired to do anything, it's because God is trying to contact you. Your creator, the source of your life, the one who gives you the right to breathe, the one that keeps your heart beating. He's trying to contact you. And he's saying, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come, get saved. Time is running out. He didn't say, come and join a church. Come give your 10%. Sunday best. Go join the Catholic. He didn't say any of that stuff. Come unto me. Jesus. You don't have to come to me, Brian Denlinger, as a preacher and say, hey, I, I need to confess my sins to you. Don't do that for one second. I'm not trying to get your money. I'm not trying to get you to join my church or anything else. I'm trying to get you to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and to read about it in this King James Bible right here. You better do it. You better do it. You can hear in the background right now. That's a log truck. We've gotten so good here. There it goes. We've gotten so good here, we can actually hear the mechanized machines. We can say, oh, there's the feller buncher. Oh, there's the truck loading the, the logs on to the log trucks to go to the big mills and things. They're just raping the farce up here all the time. 
God's not going to keep putting up with that. I'm not against logging. Like I said earlier, I'm not against logging. But the way they do it here in this state, it's terrible. It's atrocious. <laughs> but whatever. Uh, the signs are everywhere. Look at the people. Their souls are damaged. They're just walking around just... People on pharmaceutical drugs, war coming, all the bad stuff. You can see it. You can feel the sorrow of God. But you just, a lot of people are just going to mess around. Well, yeah, I'm kind of sad for the way things are going. And, and oh, I'm sorry. And in loving memory of so-and-so that died because they were wicked and didn't turn to God. And, and uh, yeah, sorrow of the world worketh death. And you'll get to the point, and there's quick ways to commit suicide, and there's slow ways to do it. You get into drugs, that's a slow way to commit suicide. You go drink yourself into a stupor and just get drunk and knock yourself out so you don't even know what's going on. That's another slow way to commit suicide. Or you can have godly sorrow and understand these feelings that I'm feeling are because of my connection to God, the Creator. And I want to know Him personally, and I want Him to save me from what's ahead, to save me from the wrath to come. Are you going to do it today? Do it. You're running out of time. I pray you take heed to these things. I pray you get a King James Bible and look this stuff up for yourself. Don't take my word for it. And uh, you decide to just ignore this. You say, well, I'm an atheist. I'm a man of science or a woman of science or whatever else. Okay. Um, see how well your science saves you from what's coming, um, you're lost. And you're going to see some horror in the future. So that is going to be it. Um, please watch some of our other videos if you want to, to know more about salvation, how to be saved according to the King James Bible. Um, but get straightened out today. Nothing is more important. If you're feeling the sorrow of God, you need to get it figured out today. God is trying to contact you. He's not going to do that forever. 